Well, good morning, church. Happy Palm Sunday to you. How y'all doing? Let's sing out some songs to our Savior. Here we go. There is a place of sorrow and love. The innocent Savior, broken and bleeding for us. The nails in his hands, the thorns on his brow. Rivers of mercy endlessly flowing down. Come on, we sing. The Son of God, high and lifted up. The Father's love came pouring down for us. He has overcome. Sunday. John 12, 12 through 13 says, The next day, the great crowd that had come from the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet them, shouting, Hosanna! 
Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Sing it out with me. I see the King. Grab your communion cups and take a seat.
Well, as, as I was standing back there and hearing everyone singing Hosanna, Hosanna, and thinking about this being Palm Sunday, right? Like this is a day of celebration. Jesus came into town and people were waving palm branches and they were welcoming the expected Messiah, right? That was an exciting day. And here we are, thousands of years later, still shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. That's right, yeah, it's exciting, right? This is something to celebrate. But just in one week, a lot, a lot happened. And a lot can change in one week, not only for us, but but obviously for Jesus. He went from a place where he was being celebrated and honored into a place where he was on trial, to a place where he was being killed. And he had volunteered this life so that we could be saved, right? And so today we are living in anticipation, right? We're living with excitement and we are praising and singing Hosanna, Hosanna, because we are grateful to the one that has saved us. And so as we move into this moment of communion, let's enter it with just a feeling of celebration and gratitude for what Jesus has done for us. So if you will, grab your communion cup with me. And as we take the bread together, let's remember and celebrate the fact that he willingly gave his body and his body was broken for each of us. And now let's continue by celebrating with the cup. Let's drink the juice together and remember that his blood was spilled for the forgiveness of our sins. Let's pray. Hosanna, Hosanna, Jesus, we praise you today. We thank you for the sacrifice that you made on the cross and we celebrate you overcoming death. God, we are thankful for who you are, for what you've done in our lives for the salvation that you brought to each one of us. We praise you, we thank you, we love you. In your name we pray, amen. Let's continue in worship together. Stand with me again as we sing one more song. Let's continue to worship together. Oh, 
power. We usher in your presence, Holy Spirit. There is no other king but the name that is Jesus. Let's sing. So come on, my soul. So don't you get shy on me. Lift up your soul. imagine that that is just a glimpse and just a super small snapshot of what it's going to be like in heaven when we get to worship our king forever. I'm so excited for that day. And it's just a snapshot into Palm Sunday as, as Jesus was ushered into Jerusalem on a donkey, all the people singing alleluia. Man, something powerful happens when we all sing alleluia. I love it. Well, thank you guys so much for taking the time to worship with us this morning. Why don't you turn to someone next to you, greet them, and then you can have a seat. Derek, and we're sure glad that you're here with us this morning. Hey, if you're new here, if this is your first time, we don't want you to feel new for long. We'd love to meet you. So after service, if you would join us out in the living room right across the lobby, uh, we have a free gift for you and would just love to welcome you to Compass. That's right, because we want you to know all the great things that are happening around here, because every week something good is happening, and one of our favorite things is life change that we celebrate through baptism, and today is no exception. We have six new people getting baptized, so let's celebrate. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome to see. The other thing that is amazing about Compass is how we take care of our Compass family through the Dollar Club. 
Each week we have everyone throw in an extra dollar. We pool that money together and we use it to help someone in our Compass family who's in need. I know we've heard these stories week after week, but once again, there's a single mom raising two kids. Mom had, had gotten hospitalized and of, as you can imagine on her limited income, bills started stacking up and it got to be too much for her to bear. Derek, tell me how much are we able to bless her with? Yeah, so because of your generosity, we're able to pay off her medical bills with $2,731. Yeah, that's exciting. It is so cool to see the generosity of this church. And if you want to partner with us in ministry financially, there's a lot of ways to give. You can look up here on the screen and you can find out those ways. We've got giving boxes in the back, but we're thankful that this is such a generous and, and giving church. Um, another cool thing about this week, right? I've already said that this is Palm Sunday, which starts Holy Week, um, which means that Good Friday is coming. And here at our church, we like to do a really special Good Friday service that just kind of uh, honors the moment and, and spends time focusing on what Jesus did. And so this Friday night, right here in this room, we're gonna have a Good Friday service at six o'clock. We're gonna have childcare through fourth grade, but we'd love for you to be here and be part of that service, but also some other. Yeah, not only that, but throughout the day on Good Friday, we will have a room on our campus, C100, which is our preteen room right across the way there. It will be open on Friday from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. for you to have a self-guided prayer experience you can walk through the Stations of the Cross at any time. And that should be pretty special. And that leads into the Easter weekend, right? We're going to have services on Saturday and on Sunday. So 5 o'clock on Saturday night is when we hope to see all of you guys. We hope that you are going to come on Friday night and make space for all of our guests on Sunday morning because we know it's going to be a big full service and we want to have plenty of room for all the people that you're inviting because we're going to have places for people to take photos outside. We're going to have lots of fun and stuff for the kids. Um, and we're going to have baptisms up here, right here on the stage, which we know is a great celebration. So it's going to be a weekend that you don't want to miss, but we, again, we want you to invite your friends, right? We want this to be a time where you're inviting uh, your barista, the people that you see, right? Get them to church, invite them to be part of the celebration that is Easter. Invite your friends to Easter, but also invite your friends to our upcoming event, Comedy Date Night. April 11th, yes, some people were telling me it's about time we've had a comedy event here and we are going to April 11th. Um, it will be a fun-filled night here in this room for the adults with comedians. There'll be laughter as well as learning and we've also got your kids covered. Childcare is included uh, and the little kids will have a magician performing for them. Teenagers will have the bridge available to them that night as well. So there is no excuse not to come and also not to invite your friends. We hope to see you on April 11th. There's a QR code there for more information, but we'll also have a card out in the lobby. So come see us there. Yeah, so put on your top hat and your dancing dress, right? Yeah, <laughs> Should dancing. be a party, right? Speaking of looking good, I know you've been eyeing my shirt. I've been looking at you, I've been seeing it, and I know you want one. And we've been telling you each week that we have these shirts. Like a lot of you were saying, what do we wear on a serve Saturday? What do we do? Uh, we have this shirt so that you can represent Compass wherever you go. But the only way to get it is through the QR code, the pre-sale, there's stuff outside you can get it, but this is it. Today is the last day you can get this. We're not having extras, this is it. So when you call us tomorrow and say, hey, I didn't order a shirt, we're gonna be like, man, you should have listened to Derek yesterday because he told you that's it, right? It's the end, I'm telling you right now. So order it, look cool, right? It's gonna look great. So we wanted to be part of the club, right? Wear the shirt around. So get these shirts and now we're getting ready to hear from Pastor Kevin as he continues our series, but first we want you to hear a message from one of our great volunteers. Hi, I'm Dale Dykstra. I currently serve with Compass Kids in the elementary ministry. I, I came into that ministry thinking, oh, this is going to be so much fun. It's going to be great. And uh, the first couple of years were a little frustrating because everything's not great. A lot of things are great, but everything's not great. And I think uh, it started to click when I when I got out of um, Sunday school mode and into 
We're here to make forge relationships with these kids. We're here to lead them to find and follow Jesus. And, and a lot of times, that doesn't mean a kid has to sit at the table and be quiet and, and listen. Kids get enough school, all right? We want them to experience Jesus here. A um, little girl showed up, her name is Liberty. And she was the shyest little girl. And you know the, the story of, you know, the 99 sheep leave the 99 behind and go and go after the one that resonated with me at that point. That, 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 okay, the other kids in class, they're doing okay. This girl really needs some attention. So, so I made it a point to really kind of start investing in, in Liberty. She would, she, she would walk in the door and say, hey, Liberty's here, right? We, we had a big celebration, you know, we we're dancing around. And um, I made it a point to sit down and chat with her. And I uh, found, out, found out that she was in cheerleading and some other stuff. And of course, we tried to do cheers together and I was a disaster and we laughed. And, and, it, and I think over, the, over time, that relationship was just, just built and built and built to the point where she was, she was walking into class much differently. Um, after a couple months, only a couple months, um, she shared with me one week, Mr. Dale, I'm gonna get baptized. I said, whoa, that's awesome, Liberty, congratulations. I'm so happy for you. So we celebrated that a little bit. Um, during that week, her, her mom called me. She said, Mr. Dale, Liberty has specifically asked that you baptize her. And I got the opportunity to baptize a little first grader who two months prior didn't even want to be Compass Kids. But we developed that relationship, um, just talked to her on her level, celebrated the fact that she was there, and sure enough, God blessed me with that. Only a couple months later, I'm in the baptismal Baptizing, baptizing her in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Baptizing Liberty wasn't about me, it was about her. And I've told myself, Dale, don't forget the big picture. Don't forget why we're here. You know, to lead these kids into a, a lifetime relationship with Jesus. If that doesn't happen this week, that's okay. And don't forget that, that big mission statement. You know, it's, you know, it's not always gonna be, it's not always gonna feel like we're making progress to that mission statement. But you are. Don't forget the big picture. And, and that's what I kind of keep, keep coming back to. Love it. Hey, do you have anyone in your life who is a killjoy? You know the, oh, I can, yep, there they are. Are you sitting next to them? Don't say anything. Uh, you know this person, they're the downer, they're the ruiner of good moods. The person that opens their big mouth at the exact wrong time and says the exact wrong thing. I had a friend in high school who was notorious for being the killjoy. He would just sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes he'd just fail to read the room and say the most insensitive thing at the wrong time. He would spoil movies we hadn't even seen yet. We're like, why'd you, why are you doing this to us? Like stuff like that. And I have so many stories of times that the killjoy struck. I'll just tell one of them right now. We're seniors in high school. And uh, the, the killjoy is in this, in this story, in this friend group, and we pulled like the most epic prank I think like, we've ever pulled. So we had a mutual friend who went to a different high school. She was also a senior, but she was an assistant coach on her high school girls softball team, like the freshman team. And so the freshman girls were all going to one girl's house for a movie night, and she tells us about it, and we're like, well, we're definitely gonna mess with them then. So uh, her job, like our inside man, her job was simply to get the girls to the back of the house in the living room watching a scary movie. And we're like, we'll do the rest. And so she texts us and is like, we're there, we're watching the movie. And so we roll up and one friend goes to the side of the house right by the breaker box. Another friend goes to the other side of the house right by a kitchen window. I go to the front door and then we took my brother, my younger brother, we put him in a plain white t-shirt and we smeared ketchup all over the t-shirt. And on the signal, my friend cuts the power to the house, starts banging on the bedroom window right next to the breaker box. My other friend on the opposite side starts banging on the kitchen window and screaming. I'm screaming and banging on the front door. And then my brother takes a run at the sliding glass door in, right next to the living room, like feet away from where they were just watching a scary movie and then the power cut out. He runs up and he goes, boom, and then just slides down the sliding glass door like this real <laughs> slow. And we instantly knew the prank worked because all we could hear is hysterical screaming from inside the house. And we're like, go, go, go. So we book it. We're out the front. We get to the getaway car, which is driven by the Killjoy, and we're off. Okay. Three minutes later, we get a phone call from our inside man. And she's like, you can hear like hysterical crying in the background. And she's like, guys, 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 you'll never believe what happened. And we're like, tell us, we'll never believe what happened. 
And she's like playing this off as though we're hitting, she's giving us the, the account of the night. And she's like, I know you guys are out tonight and maybe you're not even close by, but if you happen to be nearby, could you just come by and maybe like check things out and make the girls feel safe? And we're like, oh, what a coincidence. We're in the neighborhood. We'll just, we got nothing, we'll just swing by. So we cleaned up my brother, made sure that didn't give anything away. We show, we show up to the house and we roll in like heroes. We're like, ladies, the Calvary is here. We're fine. Like, we're going to check this out. Tell us what happened and where we need to go. We'll investigate the crime scene. And they take us and they're showing us the room and like the power went out and they showed. And then this creepy guy hit the back and we're like, let's check this out. So we go outside and we're staring at it. We're like, hmm. Yeah, that's ketchup. You guys were victims of a prank. So sorry to, that you guys had to experience that. I'm like, oh, and they're, they're all relieved and we're heroes. And we're like, you know what we're gonna do just to make sure you're safe? We'll do a sweep of the neighborhood and just make sure there's no sketchy characters out there. So we pretend to do that. We drive like three houses down and park for five minutes. And then we come back and we're like, ladies, we did a perimeter sweep. Everything seems to be safe and secure. I think you're fine to continue your movie night. And we're gonna stroll out like heroes, right? Scot-free, getting off with no problem. And then the killjoy for absolutely no reason, just blurts out, out of nowhere. Uh, it was us, we were lying to you the whole time and she was in on it. And I have never seen a situation turn that bad that fast. We barely made it out alive. <laughs> our, our mutual friend, the inside man, did not have such luck. She got tackled by the girls. We were, go we're out, we're gone. Got in the getaway vehicle and left. The next day we saw her, apparently they had duct taped her to a chair. They, they spent hours cutting and dyeing her hair and giving her the worst makeup you've ever seen and they took so many pictures. All because the killjoy couldn't keep his mouth shut. All that being said, I have to apologize in advance because I'm about to be the killjoy right now. Like we just watched this amazing video Right? And God's moving and he's empowering someone to use their gifts to serve the next generation. And a little girl's life has changed and she gets baptized. And it's this amazing story. And then the killjoy shows up to give you this information. This whole introduction I just gave was only to soften the blow that today's sermon is all about death. It's all, of, I know, you feel it in the room, the tension just, I think that was the second time a situation just flipped like that. This, the sermon today is all about death, and there's a lot of takes on death out there, but there seems to be one unifying feature of the concept. We don't like it, and we try to avoid it at all costs, right? We don't like to talk about it. We don't like to be around it. If we find out that we even have to, like the prospect of going to a funeral, all of a sudden like there's this unease, there's this awkwardness inside of us. We don't even want to have to go to the funeral. We don't wanna talk about it. We don't wanna say that people died. We'd rather say like, well, they, they passed on or, or they're in a better place right now. Or words like graveyard seem like really morbid to us, so we change it, we call it cemetery or we call it the, the memorial park. And I know it wasn't the first Funeral I went to in my life, but the one that I remember, the earliest one I remember, I was 16 years old, and my cousin, who was just a couple weeks older than me, died in a car accident. And I went to the funeral, and before the funeral, they had a, they had a viewing, they had a wake, and it was, an, it was an open casket, and I'd never been to something like that before. And to see my cousin, who was so, like, full of joy and full of life, every time I saw her, now just laying there, like, frozen, lifeless, that stuck with me because death is sad and death is scary and we need help to process it and to figure it out, which is why some of the great storytellers of all time have explored the concept of death, giving us quotes from some of the most legendary and iconic figures in movie and literature history. Here's a couple examples. End. No, the journey doesn't end here. Death is just another path, one that we must all take. It's Gandalf from The Lord of the Rings. Another famous wizard with a take on death said, after all, to the well-organized mind, death is but the next great adventure. It's Dumbledore from the Harry Potter series. The same idea from a boy who was famous for his flying skills who said to die would be an awfully big adventure. And maybe you'll remember what Obi-Wan said to Darth Vader in one of their infamous Duels. He said, if you strike me down, I'll become more powerful than you can possibly imagine. So many interesting takes on death, and I know this isn't nearly all of them, but I think what you'll find here, you'll find in most of these quotes on death in these epic stories, 
that the more famous protagonists of these types of stories, the, the good guys, death isn't nearly as scary or intimidating to them as it tends to be for us. It's almost as if to them, death is a good thing. In fact, the antagonists, the bad guys in these same stories are notoriously scared of death and are obsessed with the vain and futile quest for immortality. Is there anything good about death? Let's explore that concept a little bit more. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew 16. Whether you've got a paper Bible or an app on your phone, Matthew 16, we're going to start reading in a minute in verse 13. The book of Matthew is one of the four Gospels. you got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that kick off the New Testament of the Bible. They tell us the good news about the life of Jesus. Tradition attributes the authorship of the book to Matthew, one of the 12 disciples. And the 12 disciples were called by Jesus to follow him and to learn from him and to go out and carry his mission uh, into the world. And so the disciples have been doing this for a time and in that time they got to see some really crazy, amazing things. They saw healings, they heard like teaching in new ways that they had never understood scripture to be uh, interpreted before. They saw Jesus perform miracles, like all sorts of crazy stuff. And here in Matthew 16, Jesus is gonna ask the disciples after about being with him for like two or so years, so they've had some time being with Jesus, he's gonna ask them if they truly know who he is and what he's here to do. Matthew 16, starting in verse 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the son of man is? Son of man's like a title Jesus would use for himself. So he's saying, who do, who do the people say that I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Messiah is a, a Hebrew term. It means anointed one. It's, it's the great savior of God's people. And kudos here to Peter. He absolutely nailed it. And Jesus goes on to tell Peter that this confession would be the rock on which the church would be built. Like the foundation of the church is this confession of Peter. Everything is great. And then we get verse 20. Jesus says, then he, or says, then he ordered his disciples, talking about Jesus, not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah, which might seem like an odd thing for Jesus to do, but we'll get back to this in a minute. Verse 21. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must Go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. And here we go. Peter, the killjoy. He was getting praised. Things are great. He had just made one of the most important proclamations ever. It has theological implications that have reverberated through generations. And then he kept talking, right? And that's what the killjoy has to do. They gotta keep talking. He actually has the gall to rebuke, to correct Jesus, to pull him aside and be like, hey, Jesus, you made a mistake. This shall never happen to you. Death, no, 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 no. First of all, Jesus, we say passed away. Second of all, that's absolutely not going to happen to you. No way. But it does. It does happen. That's the way. The way of the Messiah. The way of Jesus. His way leads to suffering and to death. And Peter has a problem with that. But as we will see in verse 23, Jesus has a strong reaction to Peter's rebuke. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. And you thought I was being harsh when I called him a killjoy. He said, get behind me, Satan, to Peter. Why does Jesus use such strong words here? Well, if you go back to earlier in the book of Matthew, into chapter four, you find Jesus having just been baptized, and he's about to start his three-year ministry. It's like two years before this moment here where he's standing there with Peter calling him Satan. And to prepare for this three-year ministry, 
Jesus decides to go off into the wilderness to fast for 40 days, to deny himself food, to focus completely, 100%, everything, all his energy on his relationship with the Father. And this is where Satan sees a potential opportunity to derail Jesus from his mission. Satan showed up and attempted to get Jesus off mission three different times. On the third of those three attempts, Jesus, or sorry, Satan told Jesus, bow down to me and I will give you all the kingdoms of the earth. In other words, if you bow down to me, you can take a shortcut to glory. You don't have to die for the sins of humanity. Don't go that way. Take this shortcut. Simply bow down to me and you can have all of this. Jesus combated each of the three temptations with the truth from God's word and then lastly said to the devil, away from me, Satan. Away from me, Satan, who was tempting Jesus to get the glory and not having to die to get it. But Jesus knew that this wasn't the way. He knew that death was crucial to the plan. So when Peter blurted out, never, Lord, this shall never happen to you, it was the exact same temptation that Satan through Jesus' way, which is why Jesus said that odd thing in verse 20. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. This is called the messianic secret. It's the idea that Jesus purposefully hid his identity as the Messiah during his lifetime. It would be like if Jesus was closing out one of our services, he would have been like, love God, love people, don't share Jesus. Shh, you keep, you keep, you keep that muted. You keep that quiet. Right? The first rule of Jesus Club is we don't talk about Jesus Club. We don't talk about <laughs> Jesus, no, no. Why? Why, Jesus? Well, Jesus only told these things to the disciples because they finally understood that he was the Messiah. And now that they acknowledge that, he could tell them what it meant to be the Messiah and what it meant for them to follow the Messiah. That death is the way. See, because people at large were not ready for that yet. The disciples barely were. I mean, Peter wasn't even ready for that yet. Are we ready for that? Ready to follow Jesus resolutely towards suffering and death. This is the way. Death is a crucial part of the gospel. For example, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 from the Bible, it says, for what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, number one importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. 1 Thessalonians 4, 14, for we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And Romans 5, 6 through 8, you see at just the right time, while we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Death is a crucial part of the gospel. It is vital to our salvation, which raises a very crucial, a very vital question. Why did Jesus have to die like, why death? Why not another way? Why not any other way? Why did it have to be death? Because death is the worst. It is the absolute worst. Death is terrible because death separates. Death separates. And we see this in physical death. Physical death. That's when death separates your spirit from your body. And thus the physical world which includes our work, the things we tried to accomplish in our lives. It includes our possessions, the things we tried to accumulate in our lives. My dad, who's the king of dad jokes, has always said that, he's like, one day at my funeral, I want you to park a U-Haul truck at the church so someone can crack the joke. Look, Dave's taking it with him. <laughs> I know, that's, that's about the right amount of laughter for that joke. That's right about, uh, like right there. Right there. Speaking of which, though, and, and more importantly and often much more devastatingly, death separates us from our loved ones, the people we connected to in our lives. Funerals, as much as they serve to honor the person who has died, they much more serve to minister to the people who are left grieving. Death separates. We see this in physical death. We also see this in spiritual death. Spiritual death is when death separates you from the source of life. That's God. When death separates you from the source of life. This death happens 
kind of ironically, while our bodies are actually still alive and breathing. Sin oftentimes doesn't lead to immediate physical death, but it does put us in a state of relational separation from the source of life, from God. That's spiritual death. And then we also see this in eternal death. That's when death separates you from God forever. This is, this is when physical death and spiritual death combine to become eternal, to become permanent. So again, if death is so terrible, why did Jesus have to die? Why is that the way? Well, a few reasons. Number one, we have to be separated from sin. We have to be separated from sin. See, because sin is such that it must either be killed or you will be killed by it. Romans 6.23 in the Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. Wages is you know, what you earn for your work. It's your payment. And like wages are for work, death is the natural return, the just compensation for sin. And being a loving God, our Heavenly Father doesn't want sin to linger and last because sin separates. Sin kills. Sin destroys. But we have entangled ourselves in sin. So if God's going to do away with the evil and the sin in this world, he'd have to do away with us too. Unless he separated us from the sin. So what God did is he used the great separator, death, to disentangle us from sin's eternal consequences. But it couldn't just be any death. It had to be a pure and holy sacrifice. It had to be someone who themselves was not entangled in the sin and thus could die in our place. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus wasn't the first person to die on the cross. He wasn't the last person to die on the cross, but he was the only sinless person to die on the cross. And that has made the difference. So why did Jesus have to die? Well, we had to be separated from sin. But then number two, we also have to be purified from sin. We have to be purified from sin because sin, sin pollutes, sin stains, sin corrupts, sin defiles. Not only do we have to be separated from it, we need to be cleansed of it. And for years and years, this was done when people would bring an animal sacrifice to God to make atonement, which means to cover over their sin. That's what the word atonement means, to cover over their sin. And it was the blood of the animal that covered over the person's sin and thus cleansed them of it. In Leviticus 17, 11, God said, for the life of a creature is in the blood. And I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. That, that covering, that atonement provides forgiveness for the sin and cleansed the person of the sin. Hebrews 9, 22, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So for years and years and years, this is how it was done. People would bring their sacrifices to God. The problem is our sacrifices are insufficient to fully deal with the problem of sin. It was only God's patience and God's mercy and God's grace that kept him from punishing the sins that he was allowing the blood of the animals to cover over. So God did what we couldn't do. God provided the sacrifice for us. Our loving, patient, merciful, gracious God provided the sufficient sacrifice for us. This is from Romans chapter three. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, in his patience, his long, long patience, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. What that means is that God, at the same time, he's just, he has to deal with sin. He has to bring justice on the sin, right? But at the same time, he's also justifying those who have faith in him because he can do that because he has separated us from that sin. If he was just, just, and not merciful and gracious, we'd go down with the sin. But because he's both just and loving and merciful, he separates us from the sin. 
So then, number three, we have to walk away from sin. We have to walk away from sin. And let me first say here that this isn't something that any of us can do on our own. It is only through God offering the sacrifice that separated us from sin. Jesus' work on the cross, his blood, that purified us from sin so that we now have our job as it relates to sin by the power of the Holy Spirit to walk away from it. Now that we've been separated from it and cleansed of it, we walk away from sin. Back to Matthew 16. And since it's been a minute, let's do a quick recap. Okay, ready? Who am I? You're the Messiah, right? He says, shh, but don't tell anybody. He's like, but the Messiah has to go and die. He's like, no, you don't have to die. And he goes, actually, I do have to die. Get behind me, Satan. Okay, that's the recap. Here we go, verse 24. (laughs) Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? which is another call back to Satan's temptation. Remember, gain the whole world, but you've got a bad enemy, you've got to forfeit your soul. And Jesus said no to that, right? Because there's another way. But let's focus on those first few words that Jesus says. He says, deny yourself and take up your cross. Deny yourself and take up your cross. What Jesus is saying here is that since the way of the Messiah is death, the way of the followers of the Messiah, Christians, is also death, Crucifixion was a means of capital punishment in many cultures in the ancient world, including the Romans. They would nail or tie a person to a cross or a big wooden beam, and they would just hang them there up there to die. What the Romans would do to add on, because they're always trying to figure out how more ways to torture people, they would actually force people to carry their own cross to the place of crucifixion. So the concept of taking up your cross meant only one thing to the people who heard Jesus' words. You're about to die. Remember, when Jesus spoke these words, he hadn't been crucified yet. So the cross was not yet associated with resurrection like we know it to be today. At this point, it wasn't a symbol of hope. It wasn't a bumper sticker. It wasn't a t-shirt. It wasn't a necklace. By telling people that to follow him, they would have to take up their cross, Jesus was saying that you need to die. And he doesn't mean a physical death. He means a death of their self. The idea that I'm the king of the world and the the world should revolve around me needs to die. And there's no resurrection of this self. That wasn't even on the table yet. It's a permanent death. It would have been jarring for the disciples to hear Jesus describe following him, which they'd been doing for two years, and they thought they kept wanting to do that. And he's like, well, it means you gotta die. I'm like, whoa, hold on. That must have been jarring for them. It's probably jarring for us Two, that discomfort that comes with the topic of death because the reality is we think it's great that Jesus died. We just don't want to die ourselves. We love that Jesus sacrificed for us. We just don't want to sacrifice anything for him. We are so thankful that he separated us from sin and he purified us from sin, but we don't want to walk away from that sin and self. Instead, we'd rather follow the gods of self. Like comfort. Comfort's become a God to us. We constantly strive to make things easier and easier for ourselves, so much so that when something demands even the slightest bit of discipline or sacrifice, we immediately reject it. Or busy schedules. Busy schedules and other priorities have become God's to us. We're running and running and running to so many things. We don't have time to get into God's word. We don't have time to serve consistently at church. We don't have time to talk to our kids about God, but maybe it's that we don't make time. We don't care enough to make time because busy schedules have become a God to us. Or how about control? Control has become a God to us. If it's not my plan, if it's not my idea, I don't wanna do it. God's calling me to do that. I don't wanna do that, so I'm just not going to do that because I wanna be in control. That's not my thing over there. Or how about entitlement? How about pride? How about greed? They've all become gods to us. And just like those other gods, they're all about self. When we live to please those gods, we aren't following the son of God who said, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. You ever heard the term, that's my cross to bear? Right? People might say something like, well, of course I'm abrasive and overbearing. That's just my cross to bear. Or of course I expect too much from others, but that's, 
That's just my cross to bear. Or I have a bad temper and I hurt people when I'm angry, but you know what? That's just my cross to bear. Or sometimes I might, you know, have a few too many, but you know what, guys? That's just my cross to bear. Jesus showed us the only way to solving the sin problem, and it's death. We must die. The cross shines a light on all the ridiculous and pointless ways we go about trying to purge sin from our lives. We try behavior modification, we try scapegoating, we try blaming, we try victimizing, or even resigning to the idea that this is just who I am. It's my cross to bear. But that's the thing, though. You don't bear a cross forever. You bear a cross so that you can die. If you're not gonna kill it, it's not your cross to bear. It's just more of yourself that you're holding on to. The cross to bear is yourself. That's what needs to die. Once and for all, a permanent death. Although in Luke's telling of these events, he actually includes a word that Matthew left out. He uses the word daily. Luke 9, 23, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. This is a daily battle. It's a daily surrender. It's a daily sacrifice. I know someone who wakes up every single morning, and the first thing they do when they get out of bed is they get into a, a posture of prayer. They recite Luke 9, 23, and then they, in prayer, they offer up themselves as a sacrifice to God just so they can follow Jesus faithfully that day. Imagine the difference it could make in your life if you denied yourself daily and resolutely followed Jesus no matter where he asked you to go. I wonder if when everything went down, when Jesus was arrested and he was mocked and he was beaten and he was flogged and he was forced to carry his cross to the hill, did the disciples in that moment Remember the words that Jesus said. Deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. What were they thinking when the crowds were shouting, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him, not me. I don't want to die. I don't want to change. I don't want to sacrificially follow this guy. Crucify him. What about us? Are we echoing the cries of the mob? Crucify him. Or are we gonna be willing to take up our cross, deny ourselves, and follow Jesus? Like all of us, I struggle mightily with a consistent daily denial of self. When I think back over my life, there's so many good things that happened. When I killed the God like little g God, of control. That's one of the big ones for me. That's one of the self things that I struggle with a lot. It's control. That's the part of self that I have a hard time with. So many times, God's plans came crashing down into my plans, and I now have a decision to make. What am I gonna do? Pastoral ministry, working with teens, that was not my plan. That wasn't my plan. Foster parent, not my plan. Adopting four kids, definitely not my plan. None of these things were my plan. But had I not died to self in those situations and resolutely followed Jesus, I can't fathom all the amazing things I would have missed if I had just been selfish. In fact, I now think about it and kind of regret all the times I did not die to self. How many amazing things did I miss out on? So, when it comes to your self, what needs to die? What needs to be brought to the foot of the cross and left there to die? What sin have you been holding on to? Is it control, like me? Is it pride? Is it a bad habit or an addiction? Are your priorities out of whack? Are you worshiping a created thing as opposed to the creator? Is it fear? God's been telling you to act and you've just been frozen and paralyzed with fear? Is it greed? which literally is selfishness, is it doubt? Which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but if your doubt is actually driving you away from God instead of drawing you closer to him in curiosity, then it needs to go. It needs to die. For some of us, though, it's gonna have to be our whole self. There's maybe never been a point in our lives where we've crossed the line of faith, meaning we've confessed that we're a sinner, that we're unable to save ourselves, that we need 
Jesus, whose death separated and purified us from sin and whose resurrection paved the way for eternal life with him. You might, for the very first time, need to give your whole self to God as a living sacrifice to him. So when you've thought about it, and maybe even taken a moment to pray about it, you'll have some space to do that here in a sec, and ask God to reveal what that is. I want you to use a pen in the seat back in front of you, and you might need to share with someone else down there. And you should have gotten a little card like this when you walked in. If you didn't get one of these, put your hand in the air, and someone will come around and and bring one to you if you need one. But I want you to write on this card what concerning yourself needs to die. While you do that, our worship team is gonna play a song. And as they do, I wanna encourage you, every single person in the room, when you're ready, to get up from your seat, to locate one of the crosses in the room. We got some down here, we got some back there, whichever the nearest one is to you. Bring that slip of paper with you that you wrote on and place it in the receptacle you'll find at the foot of the cross. Lay it down, leave it there, let it die, walk away. Walk away from that sin in the freedom that only Jesus' death and resurrection provides. And then when you're done, come back to your seat because we've got more in store for you. There you can respond to God in worship because he alone deserves our praise. Let's pray. Jesus, we love you and we thank you so much for showing us the tough way, the way we had to go, the way that you went first. You died to separate us from sin, to purify us from sin. And now you have empowered us with the Holy Spirit so that we can walk away from sin. And we're gonna do that right now. God, please bring to mind that that part of ourself, maybe that that we haven't even realized. Bring it to mind. Give us the courage to write it down and to take it to the foot of the cross, to leave it there to die and to walk away from it, feeling confident that you have taken that away from us, you have purged that from our lives and that we can walk new in our relationship with you. We love you, Jesus. and In your name we pray, amen.
around me Against every weapon that's formed The thief and his plans will pass over And he sees the red on the door I plead the blood standing, I'm going to read some scripture. This is from 1 John 1, starting in verse 5. God is light, 
In him, there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, which is like holding on to your sin and self, then we lie and we do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. That's not what we did today, is it? We brought it out into the open. We were honest with God. We admitted to him that we needed to deny ourselves. We needed to bring our sin to the cross and then leave it there to die. And when we do that, the very next verse here says this, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Because of the death of Jesus, because of the blood of Jesus, we are separated from our sin, we are cleansed, purified from this sin, and we don't have to carry it around anymore. The good thing about death is that the stuff that needs to die, dies. And the people who need to live can flourish in resurrection. So church, from here, we will go out today and we will carry the gospel, the good news about Jesus with us, that God is good, that God loves, that God forgives, that God saves. We have seen it, we've experienced it, we've witnessed it. Sing it out, I witness. called to go out into this world and be witnesses and you know what we do always say at the end of the service we love God we love people and we share Jesus have a good one